So welcome to Growing the Edge. And today we have a special edition about Guild Graft. And I'm uh, joined by my friend, uh, Susan Hasty. Hi, Susan. Hello. Um, so this is a bit weird because normally I do, I do like the kind of facilitating and the interviewing, but you're going to turn the tables on me today, aren't you? <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll have um, a dialectic session. So how do you want to get started then? I'd like to pick up where you and I were just kind of diving into uh, the conversation around uh, around guilds and around governance. Um, and um, and we were talking about you know, the the governance is, has a lot to do with the boundaries of our freedom. Um, and and you had mentioned about you talked about Jeff Bezos, and and um, and mentioned about the agility. So it kind of spun, you know. A it's like you know you hear so much about the term agility, um, yeah. and um, and of course you know I'm, I'm as I said I'm writing a book about how people negotiate in business. Um, and and so but so it was like how do we how do we contrast how do we understand agility in terms of people's freedom and where are the boundaries what what is that what does that mean and and yeah. in the context of yeah you know, the guilds because i see and it's not just me i've actually seen the term guilds come up a number of times um, around cooperatives around you know the where we're moving to so you're you know you're as as uh you know your your purpose is is to be ahead of the curve so chris you <laughs> you're you you're 50 years ahead of everybody else <laughs> so. um yeah um maybe or 50 years behind that's the other point so so i think probably so what you've what you've done susan is is john coltrane Style. You've started in the middle of the sentence, and you're moving in both directions simultaneously. So, so if we, if we, which is kind of cool. So, so if we try and if we try and look at that, you know, the the point you're making about agility and about boundaries. Maybe what I can do is just give a very brief, you know, story of of how these things started. So, um, about seven years ago, I got a chance to run a team, and I'd never, I'd never run a team before and i started doing it and i i do things my own way i'm, I'm an awkward type of person like that um, so i suppose i could be described as a, a positive deviant as it were i find normally good ways of doing things but i kind of work them out myself so basically my approach to running a team was that and i had 10 people and we were doing something with cloud computing and we we were we were early very early adopters or pioneers locally within our within our organization about doing something that hadn't been done in the organization before now, now let, and, me, let me let me ask a question so we're at that time were you a enterprise architect yeah okay so yeah but i was fairly new in the role i mean the thing is <clears throat> that i I like being quite hands-on. So, so while I had a title of enterprise architect, um, I was fairly new in the role, and I was just I'm just interested in being a problem solver and, and trying to work out why 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 isn't this team or technology working, and how can we how can we make it work better? So I'm I'm that, or how do I solve a certain problem? That's so I'm that type of person. So the the actual initiative was about providing um, a new a new platform um, to the business around APIs and around single view of the customer. So actually providing intelligence about, um, you know, the customer's needs to, to help with our field force. And I, and I work for a company called Centrica, which is an energy and services company. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up with this team of about 10 people trying to put this stuff together and I was already quite secure in my own abilities to solve technical problems. So I thought it would be more interesting to actually focus on them. Uh, and what I did then is I really tried to harness their enthusiasm. And I suppose looking back, it was about 
flow and it was about boundaries but I, I didn't really maybe see it consciously like that at the time I mean I remember spending a lot of time for example um, listening to people and I noticed they had their own ideas and I didn't want to squash their ideas I mm. wanted to encourage them and very importantly I wanted to encourage their ideas even if occasionally I felt I had a better idea so rather than saying, okay, I'm the leader, I've got the better idea, we're going to do this. Instead, I would keep that idea, whether it was better or worse, I didn't know, but I thought it might be better, in my back pocket. And I would kind of see what they did, almost like an experiment. Uh -huh. And then if it worked, I would I would like, well, double down on it. If it didn't work, I'd have my idea in the back pocket, you know. Okay. So, so you were kind of, you were granting them permission in a way. Yeah. So, so do you remember... Yeah, you know, when when you when you started granting permission, yeah, you know, what what was their initial reaction? They they obviously yeah you know, became they became more free to yeah. express their ideas. Is there anything in particular that you know that that you know that, that maybe you had to kind of yeah you know, I mean you can you have this idea, but they they were still within the bounds of their own roles that maybe maybe not they had this permission before yeah what i did is i tried to create little frameworks for people that it was like scaffolding that was just enough to kind of give the give them the boundaries they needed to to direct the work so it it okay. dovetailed together and what was interesting is different people needed different boundaries so so some people there was somebody on the team who really liked to be given just a high level objective and just l left alone and uh -huh. he was really really motivated to to work within a, a very loose framework um there was another person on the team that that liked to talk things through mm -hmm. and i would spend probably an hour a day talking to this individual and that was how he worked so what i found is i adapted my style to whatever the individuals needed to give them the freedom and some people like a lot some people like none at all some people like something in between some people may like it but they may not be used to it so it's starting yeah. a new new habit so we found we found we just muddled through and there was a sense of muddle but there was a sense of energy muddled energy messy. and because messy, it was messy, messy, messy. You, you know and i think you you talked about you know birthing being messy you know with with the recent live stream show and it's like a very good point so it was messy but it wasn't like completely out of control messy. It was okay. messy, but it was it, it, it had some shape to it too. So we had really these two-week sprints. So it was like an agile, set up as an agile project okay. with two-week two sprints. So the work was divided into two-week sections. And we would always make it, I would always try and make it so the the boundary was always one that we would we would succeed at so we would we would kind of try and try and change you know we would adapt the scope so we always felt that we'd grown morale and grown as a team in the process so it wasn't about did we achieve this or did we not i would always try and make sure we did achieve something even if i changed the parameters somewhat so we grew as a team from iteration to iteration so what happened is over a period of time we grew a very strong amount of trust within the team. Mm -hmm. and, and it was very much based on, you know, a very flat type of structure. So I could have been a bit more, you know, stronger, you know, and, and, and like more traditional in terms of my leadership, leadership, but that's not really my style. And also that wasn't necessarily appropriate because there were a lot of unknowns. So we needed a lot. I needed to do a large amount of, you know, letting people just do their thing and delegate. So okay. we got the expiration. So we just fitted in a few roles. So after about six weeks or so, we had um, the we had a window behind us. We were all on a bank. Most of us were in bank of desks. and we were actually putting loads of cards. So that was our Kanban board, as it were. Okay. But we were we were really just letting people manage their own work. I was really letting people manage their own work rate. And what we found is that each person had their own color card, and it almost seemed to be there was some healthy competition. I wasn't necessarily, I wasn't stimulating it, but it just occurred naturally. 
So yes. some person, you know, had yellow cards, this guy Richard, and he he liked the idea of being super productive. That was his thing. Um, there was another uh, friend of mine, Karthik, and he was he liked floating around to the other groups of people just to kind of keep things Can aligned. And it was really interesting. And and my role was really to be almost like the the ringmaster of this particular circus, I suppose, and keep it in line, and also defend the team against the ah. structures of the traditional organization that wanted to work in more of a waterfall manner. So what, what I what I was doing then is I was providing the waterfall wrapper so the rest of the organization could interface with us and it made sense to them but then creating that boundary, you know, we talked about boundaries and flow, creating yes. that boundary within which people could actually work in a more um, uh, a more agile, but also a, a more of a self-organizing type of way. And then I would act almost as like, you know, Janus, like the gatekeeper. I'm, I'm, I'm mapping between those those two worlds. And really what I'm doing is I'm protecting the the people inside the gate, inside the wall, to allow them to have that freedom without it being misconstrued and misunderstood by people that wanted to work in a more structured way outside. Interesting. Interesting. It's, it's so if I, um, I'm going to interject a little bit of Robert Fritz's work. It sounds like you, you in essence translated or transferred what, what typically could have been structural conflict into structural tension yeah well yeah that's a really good way of looking at it I, I hadn't looked at it like that but yes so what we what we did is we we didn't avoid conflict so much as we redirected that energy you know so people talk about you know the um anger gives you energy there's a bonus of being angry that we have energy and then it's a matter of can we can we divert that energy constructively or destructively and I suppose it's the same thing that 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 conflict we turned that was energy we turned that into tension and then we worked within the tension and that that then worked out better for for both parties. Yes, and and so when you say both parties, you're talking about your team and the organization. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So a good example would be around say cybersecurity. So I, I I cottoned on very quickly that our core our key stakeholders were our cybersecurity team and our network team um, because we needed it to be plugged together. So from a yes. networking point of view, and yes. it, we needed it to be secure. And all eyes were on us because we were we were the first public cloud platform that the company had. Had, had, had done apart from say a spin-off in a separate company so because okay. we were the first you know we had some people that were very enthusiastic but we had quite a lot of people that were saying well here's all these things that could go wrong so we were taking what seemed to be a very big risk and the cybersecurity team were paying a, a lot of attention to us they they were wanting us to um put together a large number of controls to make sure that we could keep our customer data safe. So what we then needed to do is we needed to bootstrap a secure environment. And what we realized early on, it, initially it felt like the the number of things that we were being given to do was was too onerous. It felt like, you know, we're, we're being asked to do 50 things and, and, and actually we think we've only got time to do 25 mm. then after a while and we were pushing back on that and that was i suppose conflict and then we turned that into tension because what we realized is that first of all it was a complicated subject and we weren't experts but also we realized it wasn't a battle we could we could actually win we were better off saying okay tell us what you want and we'll do it and then work on our productivity so what we were doing is then we were, I suppose, Sun Tzu style. We were not we were not trying to fight a battle that we couldn't win. We were going to we conceded. Okay, you get to tell us exactly what you want, and then our job is to deliver the business requirements and your cybersecurity requirements as efficiently as possible, so we can please both parties. Uh, so that that was like a pivot that we did. To, you know that then turned that. 
that that conflict into attention. And what was very interesting about it is we used the terminology and the frames of reference of the people in the cybersecurity department to guide our work. So we had so one of my colleagues or ex colleagues had huh. a spreadsheet of all the controls. Uh -huh. What we then did is we took his spreadsheet and then we added extra columns to show the evidence of what we've done. So we're not trying to say, OK, now we're going to take it into our frame of reference. We were saying, OK, let's use your frame of reference and build there. You now, I suppose it's a type of, you know, cognitive empathy type of style. So, again, what we're doing is we're increasing the, the flow because we're not saying, no, we're different and we're special and you've got to come yeah. into our world and talk our language. We were actually going externally and and uh, working with them within the frame of reference that they were comfortable with. And um, and so so you that that is that's kind of the language that I use for outcomes. You know, a lot of people, yeah, you know, they they automatically when I say that word, and I wish yeah you know, there was a, a another word for it, but it, people think about outcome about results. However, what it sounds like you did was is is the outcomes of your team was to ensure that um, the cybersecurity uh, client, let's say, had met their goals, yeah. which is exactly what outcomes are about. In other words, it's about what is the organization um, uh, meeting the expectations of the marketplace and um, and ensuring that everything all along the way is um, is is making sure they that their experience so it's less about so it's an outward look it's an outward focus um and um and you were able to organize around that so it, it actually you know whereas a lot of teams i'm sure um yeah they're they're like yeah, the it's almost like structural conflict is contagious yeah, I mean, conflict, I think conflict is something that many people, there are different ways of approaching conflict. Absolutely. And sometimes it feels like the classic, you know, two people debating or arguing a point. That's, that's, that's like, that's, that's very much one approach there are there are many others mm. um if we convert the conflict into tension what happens is that that can sometimes be a more effective strategy mm. you know that that's 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 the thing um and then it's a matter of understanding well what's the root of what are the roots of us not being able to do that and it could be to do with things like ego and or saving face or or Identity. feeling identity you know that's my job that's not your job mm -hmm. and and the thing is that what we did is actually uh, and particularly this is something that that i was very keen on is not to let those things get in the way you know and what i found is that does that mean that i am more empowered or less empowered if i put those things like identity and ego i'm actually more empowered i can achieve more my team can achieve more the organization achieves more is it is it good for me as an individual, as well as for those around me, um, yes, it, I can't. I haven't found any negatives to yes. that. And it, what it, what it does is, is that it kind of unlocks opportunities for everybody. Because what yeah. I'm doing is I'm taking and back to your, you know, the flow and the boundaries. Mm -hmm. I'm taking an artificial boundary. I'm saying, well, actually, I have a control about whether I'm going to yeah. say no. That's my job. So yeah. let me let me remove that boundary. That's no longer in the equation. Now there's more flow. Whether there would would have been a boundary to do with my yes. identity, yeah. Um, it was, so. And you, and you, yeah. You also enabled freedom for people to um, to loosen up their own roles and be more fluid together. Yeah. Um, and and so that that's that makes us a great segue to um, to talk about Guildcraft. And yep. um, and and also the governance, because that's in effect. Yeah. And these things are almost invisible. Yeah. And, and so so can you can you want to go there and just talk about how you how yep. you yeah what what did you when you um, moved into um, 
or maybe maybe a great question would be, you know, when did it dawn on you to, to say we need Gilcraft? And what is well, Gilcraft? Right, perfect segue. So what happened is 18 months later, we, we'd pretty much finished the project and we, and we won an industry award and, and it was kind of um, pretty cool. Um, but uh, the team was disbanded and I was like pretty disappointed about that. And it was just to do with, you know, it was just the politics. It, it was just, there need there were some other reasons. It, it was just, that's just how it was. So I, I felt I was a little bit in the wilderness and I'd got my appetite whetted in terms of public cloud and the amazing wow. things that can be done. And we were doing a very large project that I wasn't really involved in that was to do with a, a large data center migration into cloud. And this was like a huge project, unlike the small one that I, I, I led. And um, what I noticed is that that data center migration project was maybe seeing cloud at maybe 10% of its, of its um, promise. And the other 90%, um, you know, the more visionary stuff, they weren't as interested in. But there are other people in the organization um, who were. So what I noticed is that the people who were really interested in the real promise of public cloud and got the vision weren't getting their needs satisfied by the organization because the organization is like following the money. All the money is on this okay. right, humongous project to do a data center migration. Okay. So so what, what we had then is a number of people whose needs weren't being met. So all of the, the more visionary people who were into cloud didn't really have a watering hole. They didn't really have their, their needs being satisfied. So I thought, okay, well, I can help with that then. So I started working with some colleagues who are wanting to exploit more cloud native technologies like serverless and platform as a service. And I, I work, I did the groundwork to actually clear the way for them to adopt these newer technologies. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that there were lots of people who weren't comfortable with that. So it was a matter of doing lots and lots of negotiating at all levels in the organization to Absolutely, say, yeah, yeah. yes, you we've never done this before, but it's going to be just fine. It's going to be brilliant. And they'll say, I don't believe a word of it. And then we'd have a conversation. And then after a while, I realized, OK, well, this is actually a thing. Nobody's addressing this. It needs to be addressed. OK, I'll address it then. So we started a number of forums in, I suppose it was about the spring of 2018. And they had a few funny names, but what I was trying to really do is have a reoccurring meeting, maybe once a fortnight, of people that needed to negotiate almost informally about getting on the same page that we felt that we were on yes. as, as modernizers. And, um, and we started getting somewhere. And I realized, well, look, this is something that's really missing from the organization because people are spending their time doing their day job, but they're not necessarily spending time saying, is our day job the right thing to be doing? Are things going to be changing? There wasn't that medium that allowed them to have those conversations. You so, opened up the freedom for that. Yeah. So in September of 2018, I started a guild and I called it the Cloud Engineers Guild. Now, I'd, I'd heard vaguely of Spotify gills, but not not really. I didn't really know anything about them. I didn't re to be honest, to be fair. I didn't really look into them. What I did is I thought, well, I know what's required because I've already been doing it. It's, it's yeah. people need to have some frank conversations about <laughs> the nature of work rather than the 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 work itself, and they're not having them. Oh. So let's just have this as a coffee morning on a Friday um, with no agenda. And I'll, I'll invite the people I think need to have a, you know, a, a, a big boy or girl pants conversation about what's going on here. So we did that and it just grew in popularity and there was a real buzz and a crackle. Now, the model I used was actually, uh, particularly in the 90s, I had experience of group therapy. And that was the model I brought to the table. So in group therapy, you might have the psychotherapist will say, let's talk about anger and they'll draw a triangle or whatever it might be mm -hmm. on a flip chart. And then you'll have a group of like maybe 12 people in a circle 
on chairs, many of them a bit, you know, medicated and a bit dazed and everything. And then what would be interesting is people would wake up at different rates and then be ready to talk. And it was almost like a, a fern leaf unfurling, you know, in slow motion. It's this like beautiful thing. Uh -huh. And so, um, so, so if I almost want to say that you, you held a space for the healing yeah yeah but i didn't make it all woo woo i just right, I just right, right. You know, that exactly. was just in, in my head yeah. in my head it, yeah so yeah so it's yeah. really so it's really right rather than let's talk about anger I, I so first of all i would start with a type of creed a bit like an alcoholics anonymous dog creed so i said this is the cloud engineers guild i'm a cloud engineer you're a cloud engineer we're all cloud engineers leave all other job titles pay grades and egos <laughs> at the door <laughs> and, and I don't, I don't say any more. I'm but powerless I, I, over my engineering. <laughs> yeah, I, I, but I, I, I kind of said this like at the start of every meeting for probably the yep. first dozen meetings or so. Mm -hmm. And then what happened is we got this excellent debate going, and uh, I would focus, even though I had an opinion, I would some, I would get the conversation started, like let's talk about anger, and it, and I had expertise. Not, yeah. I wasn't the expert on every topic. I had expertise. But I, I kind of just used that as a tool and then I dipped in and out of that just to get the party started yeah. and then just let everybody else interact and just, just try to dip in as a facilitator. And what I tried to do then is start it almost like a sourdough starter. Who are the right people to have the first one? Oh, these people would be good. And now we've got a bit of momentum. Who are the right people to add on to the second one? And then I would just like add it and, and, and like grow the right dynamics so there was the right buzz you know if it was like 10 traditionalists and one modernizer in the first session it wouldn't have worked and, and so I, stacked also, the deck. Uh, I stacked the deck effectively in the way that i introduced people to the conversation and and also it was voluntary correct yeah yeah completely voluntary yeah, yeah. And so in other words they weren't mandated to be there it was it, it, they, they that, wanted that actually you know that that yeah. kind of fits with the whole open technology methodology yeah, that's right. It's yeah, a, it's, it's a, exactly. It's a pull rather than a push. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and also I want to um, uh, tease out something that you said that I was like, Ooh, that's delicious. Um, you said the nature of work. Yeah. So this is, this is related to, I haven't, to my, to my shame, I haven't read the Phoenix project, but um there's a line in the <laughs> Phoenix, yeah, Gene Kim. There's the, and, and others. There's a line in the Phoenix Project that's to do with putting the emphasis on the nature of work rather than the work itself. Yes. In other words, yes, the, yes. or the, the system of work. You know. Yes. Can we? Because if we patch the system of work, we get this a massive return on investment. And what I realized intuitively at the time, the system of work was a low trust environment. Yeah. And that was an extremely inefficient workplace. Well, so and, what, well, my job then was to yeah. restore some trust. Well, and and that's kind of, you know, I, I, I kind of cringe, to be honest with you, when people talk about trust. Because, uh, it, you know, again, it's like, you know, what about trust in the future? It's like I, I want to kind of get people away from, one, thinking that it's trust in an individual. And because that automatically is actually going back to the old colonialism where we had you know, this higher power who was who had all the answers. And so right. it was dictated to us, you know, the Ten Commandments, whereas in, in effect, what you you know, what you did is, is you brought in a more regenerative approach. You know, which is why I kind of tagged yeah. onto that nature part is that yeah. you 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 created the soil. Um, it, but you didn't, you didn't say, you know, this is the work you talked about, you know, the, the essence of how, how they had the freedom, um, to wake up when they wanted to, or when they were ready, it wasn't mandated. Uh, and, and they, and they found their way. I mean, that's yeah, what's beautiful that's right. about it. They found their way. Yeah, that's right. They found people, and we all found our way together because I didn't know necessarily the direction the conversation <clears throat> was going to take, but I knew who needed to be involved in it. And <clears throat> so a lot of it is then letting the letting go, and then just trusting the fact that, <clears throat> as you know, gen genuinely, you know, there are some people who play politics and play games, but most people who come to work want to do a good job. 
and and um, yeah, the that that's the thing. And what what we found is that part of the challenge was that cloud computing had just changed the game so much that a lot of people needed to get their heads around it. And there was a, there was a period of time mm. they needed to to go through <clears throat> that the organize <clears throat> excuse me the organization wasn't necessarily allowing them. So what that meant is that I was able to bring together modernizers and traditionalists, and we were able to explore each other's viewpoints, and people were able to kind of buy into things at a, at a rate that worked for them rather than it forcing the pace. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're, they're not really bought, that people were, were, were maybe not really bought into it because they were being asked to do things that they weren't ready for. So we were able to to really get to a point where uh, I suppose, and again, it wasn't a term I, I knew at the time, but it was almost like we what developed was a type of group sense making. Absolutely, so, it, yeah. and, and from there, they they were able to make meaning of yeah. of you know, of what what this meant for the organization, in addition to how they could make meaning of their own role in it. So they could they could actually yeah, you know, there, there's a actually a great book that. Um, and it's not new, but it's called the Three Laws of Performance, um, and it, it actually talks quite a bit about uh, facilitating groups that are in conflict, and uh, in a, a, a sentence that still resonates with me is is that we live into the future we see coming at us. So, so that we kind live, of goes: we live yeah. into the future we see coming at us. Well, this reminds me a little bit of the um, – that there's a Royal Holloway lecturer who was talking about the, the three stages of conflict resolution, and it was stop calling each other names, understand each other's future fears, and go for a beer together. So I think the future fears, the future that's coming at us is yeah. maybe – it. it it is then in on an emo it's often on an emotional level it's what people are anxious about uh, and that's what i realized is actually while i was a techie i realized that these weren't technical problems that were holding people back they were largely emotional conflicts that yeah. people had in in their own head and it was to some extent it was to do with um fear of the unknown and fear fear and identity uh, you know the fear of their identity in a changing world and mm -hmm. what, what what then i was able to do is i was able to blend my technical knowledge with the realization that it wasn't a technical problem so i could dip in and out i could flip the circuitry between me being almost mm. like a pretend psychotherapist I'm not qualified to do that, by the way, but, you know, I, I was trying it, you know, uh, versus actually let me dip in and talk about the technical aspect of the conversation. So so that that I found, and I wrote a blog about it, a very short one about duality engineering, because I realized that then I could work, I could then set the set the measure of whether I thought the session was successful. Yes. And if I got somebody who was usually very dogmatic, and they'd uh -huh. stop to listen to somebody else's view, uh -huh. that's a result. If we didn't agree on a plan of action, then that's not a problem because that's an, that's an enormous result. That's going to change the course of the organization's history. You know, if you've yeah. got somebody who's – so that's the interesting thing is what I learned about transformation is actually it's often looking for those small signs. You know, it's not it's not the necessarily the big dollars. It's the – you know, it's yes, like the fleeting glance or the pause or, you know, the, yeah. The, the weak, weak signals. You're looking yeah, the weak signals. Well, brilliant. So, so yeah. In other words, it doesn't have to be a, a ball, you know, it doesn't have to be that the plant's on fire. You are actually looking to where things were just starting to burn um, and knew where to, uh, to um, yeah, um, yeah, groom it more or less. Gro groom the meaning making and the sense making. Uh, because that's you know, that, what uh, in the the study in the research around strategy is is that uh, the research is showing, and this is really you know, just in the last ten years or so, have they really identified that the uh, the the strategy is not tapped down? I mean, it it may start that way, but it's actually quite circular. So the feedback loops have to. 
because in in effect, you guys were starting to um, engage in strategic decisions yeah. for the organization. You were moving the strategy forward, and and that kind of comes back to, you know, did you get any resistance from yeah you know, the C suite? Um, did you, you know, did and how did you deal with that? Yeah, well, in the early stages, they probably didn't know. So we 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 just kind of we just cracked on. And ah, um, interesting. So what happened is we only started involving the C-suite after we'd been going a few months, and uh, we got some. I think what we did is we tried to make it inclusive, and we tried to make it fun, um, and. When we started talking to the C-suite about it, they were they were intrigued, and but they were distracted. So they're intrigued and distracted. But that distraction then gave us, to some extent, cover to carry on. Yeah. You know, we we, yeah. we were like maybe yeah. the 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 ants under the patio, you know, on the under the stones in the garden. You know, we were yeah. we were just yeah. like building our building our the, you know the, earth the, structures. Yeah, you know. the the core. Did, wasn't paying attention to you so they they you know the the um, yeah. immunity to change you didn't you didn't trigger that within that within that so you were actually kind of acting on the edge yeah of the yeah that's right yeah yeah very much so and after a while it almost felt like we were creating a parallel organizational paradigm and and that's what we noticed is that when the so, so after three months, so in January 2019, I tried to expand the number of guilds. So we went from just one to about ten. So, how, how did you how did you structure those when you say differently? I mean, so were, were they different groups? Were they different teams or different, yeah, different topics or topics? Topics. So what I did is I created a Microsoft Teams site. So it was a bit like a Slack or something like the different channels. For each okay. of the topic, so it starts to get okay. into knowledge management as well. So I'm creating yes. a type of knowledge management watering hole. Now that that uh, didn't work as well because I'd grown it too quickly. From one to ten was like too much too soon. So what that okay. meant is the number of people, the critical mass to get the conversation going, I'd reduced because it had been atomized. So what happened is some of them spluttered along and then it just seemed to <laughs> die, die out mm. a little bit. But what I noticed is when we had meetings with people that had been in the regional guild, um, things just seemed to be a bit slicker. People, oh, you know, the interaction dynamic, yeah, the interaction dynamic had improved because people knew mm. each other. They They'd spent time talking about these things in more depth and it, it seemed to me that it was a thing you know so what what happened is I, I i muddled through for for a few um for a few months and then i i needed a break because i was like facilitating many of these sessions a week and it was getting a bit exhausting <laughs> yeah. so um but in in the in the so this is 2019 so in the in the autumn or the end of the summer, we had some uh, another structure. A colleague of mine um, had, had set up. There was about something like cloud acceleration or something like that, and it was it was to some extent it was a guild in all but name. Uh, and uh, I, I I came into it a little bit late, and what I realised is there were voices missing. So I had a sen I have a sense for why things aren't flowing, and it's just a. And, and basically, it? it's, it's, it's almost always the same reason. It's normally to do with the the mix of, of individuals. So I realized. So, so, so I want to I want to dig into that just yeah. a minute. Um, so when you talk, when you said the voice was missing or the mix of individuals, was that was that related to you needed someone from outside the group that was meeting, and or did yeah. you need or did you need also someone who had a different level of power? Um, it wasn't to do with power. It, more, it was more to do with perspective and need. So what we okay. were missing, what we were missing, were internal customers. So in other words, we'd set up a conversation. All of the people in the conversation were, were sub internal suppliers and internal third parties. Okay. And the reason that we were struggling to make progress was we didn't have any people who wanted things or they, people they, who they, were they, angry they were, and wanted something. Yeah. That, that that what you the topic of discussion was going to directly impact them. Yeah, you, you exactly. needed you needed people who were, it was going to directly impact them. Okay. Yeah, 
why why can't I use AWS's built-in certificate service? It would save me time. Okay, okay. so now you've got somebody like that in the conversation. Okay. The dynamic is what we're doing is we you, you know we've got a pull dynamic as well as a a push dynamic is pushing each other around when we just had supply and third party didn't work. So basically, I I, I after that. I then created the Centrica Guild Network, and what we found is after this, third, you know, second or third, this was my third or fourth, you know, attempt. What happens yeah. is it started to catch on. So this is the other thing: is what's needed is that you know the 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 patience to know that if it's the right thing to do, it may not work the first time, may not work the second time, but eventually, it's a bit like being an entrepreneur in a way. Eventually, it's going to work, and that's you're, you're, exactly so you're, you're creating happens. a practice. In other words, you're yeah. not you're not you're not ha you're not looking at it from a perspective of this is a project. You're actually no. creating a new dimensional way, multi dimensional way of of negotiating. Um, and and also, I'll say that you also you, you pushed it to the closest to where the work is done. Yeah, the shop. Yeah, it's the shop floor, the grassroots. So, yep. so very much it was a bottom up type of thing. So it was the, it was the people that it was to do with people's day to day experience. So the other thing that I was very interested in doing is during these sessions, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just experts. Mm. I wanted to make sure it was a mixture of experts and non experts, uh -huh. and strong yeah. voices and not so strong voices. And what I was trying to do is even out. The share of voice, so we were actually building together these bonds. So it was it was a supportive community, ooh, rather ooh. you know. Yes, so sh share of voice. That's a really cool frame of reference. Instead of saying you know everybody has to participate, because that's almost manipulative, right? Uh, you're you're saying yeah, you you ba you balanced out it so that you uh, you were able to uh, um, yeah pull people who. Um, one, you also gave freedom to those people who were what you're calling non-experts, and I want you to kind of uh, dive into that a little bit more. Um, you 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 were you actually put them on the same level as experts, yeah. so that was probably somewhat tricky. Um, if, if, if the expert thought that it was their job to tell people what to do. Um, yeah, I think that the 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 work is about controlling strong personalities, or not necessarily controlling them, but but dealing with strong personalities. So yeah, a shared voice, creating. Yeah, that, that's I, I right. I like because, that. I like that yeah, frame yeah. of reference. Yeah, so we might have somebody who has um, uh, an axe to grind, and they might want to talk about a topic. And they may want to talk about the same topic every week, or they may um, feel aggrieved, and that grievance is then they haven't moved forward from that. So, th so then it's interesting because we move because we because we meet typically every week. What okay. this means is that we can actually solve these problems in the longer term. So normally, if somebody, for example, has a grievance and they're talking about it in the guilds. They have a need to get that off their chest. They have a need mm -hmm. to, to for that emotional energy. That emotional energy needs to be discharged some mm -hmm. somehow. It needs to needs to be expressed. What I've noticed actually instead, instead of damping it, yeah, as, as saying no, no, it, you know, time out. No, we're not going to do. It. So what I do is I'm slightly slop. I'm, I'm deliberately sloppy to the extent that I indulge people as long as they're not kind of attacking others. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm indulging mm -hmm. that to the extent that I'm then providing a service to them to an extent to allow them to express that. But also one, what I've noticed is typically people need to have their say before they're then more receptive. So, and actually, for example, um, we've got a new body which has come out of the guilds, which is called our Centrica Cloud Council, which is built around some of the same type of uh, mechanisms. And again, there, what we're what we're doing is we're allowing if, if we've got work to do, but people some people feel very strongly about something, I would rather let people have their say and get it out rather than saying, no, we've got some stuff to do. Yeah. Because what yeah. I what I know is that in the, or what I genuinely believe is in the longer term, Susan, 
we get a better result because we're we're actually being authentic. We're 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 not we're not suppressing and blocking things that are to do with the way we are we are, we are as a whole person within the within the work context. It also maybe relates to you know the Amazon leadership principle about have backbone, bone, disagree, and commit. You know we're okay. we're, we're actually allowing people to disagree but not having that as a pathological win-lose thing more of a self-expression thing yes and 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 also yeah the yeah you you are you're allowing the shadow strategy to emerge people don't yeah. realize that there's there are strategies all over the place and they're very different and and and, and so you know look, look at this because that that is a strategy and the behavior is a structure um for for getting us getting the needs met, right? And uh, it, it that also have you read the book Sand Talk? No, you, you familiar with it? Actually, it's a, a fascinating guy that uh, he's out of Australia, and he uh, he is about the indigenous culture, and 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 it this this kind of reminds me of. Uh, the indigenous, which is more regenerative. In other words, you, you, know, you it's, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, there's this a lot of talk today about anti-rivalry and rivalrous games. Um, and, um, and it, you know, it's, it's not like either or, I mean, there's a lot of nuance there because you, know, you still have to have some rivalry but it doesn't have to be uh, where it's attacking per people. It's, it's attacking and 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 pushing pushing down and not letting those shadow strategy is emerge is is um, is rivalrous. It's actually it's creating the wrong type of rivalry because you know, you're it's kind of like coronavirus. It's like you know what the conversations we need to be having is is how do we come together as a world. And and fight the fight the coronavirus war, right? But we've got all these rivalries going on that, quite frankly, are just full of all these uh, shadow strategies, um, and uh, and and future in future sense. What are we fear? What are we fearful about? Because we can't talk about that. We we're going to talk yeah, about the fact it, that it, it, you're it, a liberal it, or I'm a conservative. And yeah, exactly. And uh, and so so that uh, so that's that's fascinating. Now it sounds just just to clarify. These were all guilds within one organization, right? That's right. Although interestingly enough, because I got a I got a little bit of a taste for it, I did start experimenting to do similar things on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, that you know, so I, I'd started blogging about my experiences and um, got people um, to, to know people who'd commented on the blogs, including your good self. And uh, I, I set up a, basically a LinkedIn group. And what we found, what I was trying to do is achieve the same results there to, to vary, varying degrees of success. I think that what's easier within an organization is there's a lot of commonality of purpose. There's slightly less, it's slightly harder to find commonality of purpose on, on, the, on the internet. Um, perhaps it can still be found. You don't have yeah. a purpose, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. There's, there's, yeah. there's actually a lack of tension. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's, that's, that's right. But I, I, being, being slightly um, bullheaded, I, I tried anyway, um, and uh, to some extent, now that's starting to work. So what I found is that now we've got. So I've got. I'm like six or seven episodes into a new live stream show growing the edge um what i found is that weekly cadence and maybe a little bit of a shared purpose and that jeopardy is mm -hmm. actually providing a bond it's providing the missing ingredient that we maybe had i i had in in these these sort of guild craft experiments that i've done in my day job now now i'm now i'm playing around with similar mm -hmm. types of of themes you know we, in, in growing the edge which is you know, listening to the episodes it's it's grappling with what this uh, um, transformation means so you know it's yeah. like that that's a term that is is um, it's being thrown around a lot but really you guys are just you know, do you're, you're taking it and grappling with it and uh, and that's 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 wonderful now the um, 
so you know, when you're talking to people within the organization or when you first started, because now the organization's kind of, they, you know, everybody has a shared understanding, a shared reality of what, what the guilds mean. Yeah. But yeah. You know, I'm sure people, when you first started, you first brought the, the topic up of a guild, you know, you had to, you had to contrast it with maybe communities of practice or yeah. with teams or teaming. How did you, how did you do that? Um, I, to some extent, I put the emphasis on creating them rather than selling them. So I shared the concept. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so the way I shared the concept was by creating them. So for example, we have a culture corner guild. Okay. It's about culture. Um, and it's really the, the bounds are really almost set by the, the, the topic and the people that uh, want, want, want to go there. And um, what happens is we talk about lots of things. I, I, I don't go as much uh, recently. And my, my colleague Sue um, facilitates that particular session. But it's really, it's almost creating a series of watering holes. And then and it, 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 and the, it sounds like that these watering holes are um, is the glue between different functions, too, because you, you yeah. mentioned you seeding the, the groups. You, you're basically making sure that they're not you know, stuck in a silo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, for example, if we have a. So, so I was talking to a colleague about setting up a test guild. And, uh, and this was in the very beginning. Well, no, no, this was actually about two weeks ago. Okay. And one of the things we were talking about is it would be better to call it the quality guilt because testing is maybe one aspect of quality, but okay. quality okay. you can do more with. So the idea is that if we have a guild that's just based on role, if we have the, the, uh, role, the project manager's guild or, yes. or the developer's guild, yes. then you, you, all you're doing is we're reinforcing the existing structure of the organization, which is to do with maybe division by... Yeah by a role or a function. Yeah. So what, what I what I would say is one of the essential elements of Guildcraft is we're deconstructing the official structures and creating an alternative reality that is cut, you know, our cloth yeah. is cut differently, maybe yes. even orthogonally. That's what gives it its power. And this is very, this much, this relates to Stan McChrystal and the stuff he did, you know, mm -hmm. team of teams and the things yep. he did, you know, to change the, the the the, the power the, the power structures the, the, the environment uh, you know the the, the you know his theatre of combat in ex Afghanistan and, and Iraq so it's the same type of thing it's you really to one to some extent you could say inadvertently I I'm I'm using or we're using network science as part of this absolutely um, yeah you know, because what we're doing is we're saying well well the official structures mean the flow of people resources ideas and information works this way. So let's mix that up. Um, yes, and yes, that's yes. healthy for the for the organization, the organization as, yeah. as an organism. You know. Yeah, yeah. It actually, it makes it, um, uh, of course, more resilient, but also anti fragile because you you basically um, are putting people together that um, that live between their between their functional areas and if you have the traditional organizational chart then you know it's very fragile when things get siloed uh, because you one silo breaks everything yeah you know, there's there's no connection there's no glue between another another functional area um and um and so so yes yeah, so that's that's fascinating just fascinating now would would you um so going from the self-organizing teams you know that you have so many of them you're actually in the mode of uh, governing them how you know, can you can you speak to that at all um so one th one thing is interesting is with the guilds it's easier for us to have a conversation and to get our heads around something and to explore the tensions sometimes than it is for us to then commit to a course of action so sometimes what we find is that because they're around a community of practice 
they're often seeding ideas that happen outside of the guild. So that's that's another thing. So sometimes the mm-hmm. guilds are almost like a think tank. Yeah. That that then in, informs work that is done in the official organisation. So so therefore we're moving, I suppose, between a self-organising modality and one that's maybe more formally organised. Yes. Yes. And. and- yeah, you're you're putting a cadence into the sense making, so that yeah, that people are uh, contributing. Uh, there, yeah, there. You, do you know the difference between tacit knowledge and technical knowledge, or, or? Um, it, it, yeah, yeah, explain it to me. Is it is it to do with whether it's subconscious uh, or? It, it uh, well, it's generally uh, knowledge that is um, it, it it's. It's very, very difficult to actually um, put into words. And in fact, in fact, that what they found is in, in knowledge management is that that's where that's where things fall in the cracks because you um, you can you can write technical knowledge down and explicit knowledge, but this is the implicit knowledge that generally comes from experience. That yeah, yeah that you really yeah you, you it's kind of like. Um, and, and I do want to tease out one one final point is is that um, you know what what you you scaled it because because there was people you seeded the new um, guilds with people who actually had embodied the practice in in the in the smaller guilds so yeah. that that has a lot to do with tacit knowledge they probably could not you know, tell somebody how to do it. They yeah. they had to they had to be there in the moment to understand how to how to open up that freedom or or to set healthy boundaries. That's 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 right. And actually, Susan, I would say that I I I'm a little bit like a sourdough starter. Uh, yes. So so when I when I when we've had new girls that have started. Um, what I found is normally I'll, I'll I'll go to the first few sessions just to help get people into the kind of the groove and uh-huh. and, and and once I feel that um, some of those points have, have maybe stuck, I, I then kind of withdraw gracefully. So so rather than just saying here's the instruction manual, go off and do it. And what because I think it's to some extent it can be a groove and a vibe. And these things I think are highly can be tacit. Uh, they're that they're they're like memes aren't they they're like things that that actually you can describe it but but it's actually people need to experience it in order to Mm -hmm. fully understand it it's Mm -hmm. um and um so therefore that 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 works pretty well and that that's a problem i see with agile as well that people you get people who've never done agile before you you send them on a course and then you put them together and you find it doesn't work and it's like well yeah um yeah it's much easier to get you know one or two people who know the score to to then seed the team and then and then bring everybody along you know and and i think that that that's just a more efficient way of actually conveying you know meaning to people and getting people up to speed so so do you think that that has to do with um what we were talking about before we started recording the difference between um, a process and a practice. Well, um, yeah, I think that uh, people are often looking for processes because people we naturally look for simple answers to complicated mm-hmm. questions. You know, we've got Dave Snowden coming on next week's show, and we've spoken to Dave before, and. You know, Dave, with his uh, Kinevin framework, is very much you know it's the yes. there's that there's that um, effectively a waterfall between the obvious and the chaotic because actually we're in the chaotic, but we think we're in the obvious. So actually, we're in the disorder region. So yeah, I, I or see the, or that the messy, well, we're the messy region. In, in messy, other words, yeah, yeah I, the when we talk about disorder, I think people do have a visceral reaction, right. Um, and you know, but but yet when you talk about messy, it's like yeah, okay, I can be messy because you know, we were messy. Yeah, exactly. Kids. Yeah, exactly. So, that's, so maybe that's, yeah, messy, fuzzy, that sort of thing. Yeah. So so I I think that what I see a lot is that um, people are nervous about 
dipping their toe into the water because they think it might be they'll get a flinch reaction it's going to be too cold for, yes. for them and, and what we're finding then is that that can be to do with identity mm -hmm. it can do do with beliefs. fear yep. uh, beliefs um it, it can also be to do with um habit people can work ex incredibly hard but a learning habit is a different type of working hard it's actually working hard at doing something other than I would have done before. And yeah. there's like a, there's a different characteristic. Now that's something that, that some people need more assistance with um, than others. And actually depending on the culture of the organization, sometimes that can be something that leaders struggle with because we may have rewarded them mm -hmm. for doing things in a certain way over a period of time. Yeah. And that's that now an ingrained habit. And then when the game changes, what we're saying, well, there's some new rules and, and we need we need to learn those new rules together. Yeah. And people's minds will be saying, no, I'm happy with the old rules. Yeah, and, because it, you, yeah. you, the, the devil you know is is better than the devil you don't know. Um, yeah. And uh, and 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 so in in effect, you're having a ripple effect on on the overall governance of the organization. Um, whether they know it or not, um, yeah. you're, you're actually changing the governance. And it, it would probably be interesting to, um, uh, if, if they were to examine the existing uh, governance from the lens that we're talking about in terms of structural tension versus structural conflict, because yeah. when you unpack it, a lot of times the yeah, there's existing rules that were, you know, were, were made a long time ago that may have applied to one area, but now they're actually creating conflict. So it's not the people who are in conflict, it's actually in the governance that's in conflict. Yeah, that, that's right. And one of the nice things about the guilds is that we get to change the organization structure of the guilds without needing to go to HR. Yeah. because it's all and, voluntary. And now, and now you've right. been brought into HR, right? Yeah, <laughs> well, well I'm, I'm, yeah, right. I'm, I'm, I'm like talking to HR about some things <laughs> as well. So, yeah. so, but the the important thing is that it's a, it's an informal construct. And I was actually talking to a, a new a new friend, Dan, who is an ex-helicopter pilot. And he was saying, I was, I was telling him th this story, and he was saying this is very similar to the idea of the officer's mess culture um in the army where you, you you would have the students and you would have the instructors and they would all be having a drink after the training and the students would open up and say well i didn't quite understand this point okay. and, and 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 then they'd have a conversation about it right and then the instructors oh. would be doing the same type of thing well i don't think i got this point across well enough okay. then eventually those groups would start intermingling and to some extent, that this is all I'm doing in the guilds. It's actually something that's extremely natural, uh -huh. normal, nothing particularly. Yeah. Um, um, what's innovative about it is more about the fact that we've almost forgotten how to be people at work and, and just to treat treat each yeah. other as, yeah, co as cogs peers. in the wheel. And, yeah, yeah cogs, rather cogs than in the wheel. I can just plug yeah. that in and, yeah, in this space. But yeah, I, I want to come back to. Um, yeah, you, what you've done is is you have. Um, I love I love that nature of work because yeah, you know, the nature it versus yeah, you know, we're hearing the future of work, but yeah, but the future of work is really the nature of work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I'm I'm very interested in interaction dynamics. So if rather like I was saying, you know, to my duality engineering point, if I see some good interaction dynamics, that's a good meeting. If we all decide to do something and we've got a plan, I, I'm not, that's not, that may or may not be a good meeting. It's actually yeah. the interaction dynamic is what I'm putting my focus on. Yes. Because what yeah. I see is that, you know, that's maybe goes to Peter Drucker's point of, you know, culture each strategy for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Yeah. Um, the, um, that actually, if I can curate the interaction dynamic, I get a, 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 there's a there's a leverage there's a kind of a magnification of there's a leverage effect. It multiplies the I possibilities, so. and I can't necessarily always draw a line and, and, and say, look, I 
I I see there's a causal relationship between us doing this and then this happening, but I feel it viscerally. I feel mm-hmm. it in my gut. I feel it's mm-hmm. the right thing to do. And when I look for evidence, I can find it. Um, but I, I'm I'm mainly doing it because it just feels intuitively the right thing to do. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you you've allowed people to um, to ne- navigate the future by negotiating. Yeah. So so yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's that's a good place for us to to uh, uh, to wrap up. I think because that 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 in essence kind of for me anyway it uh it put a nice bow on it yeah and uh yeah i i agree susan that was a a nice conversation thank you yeah thank you thank you good to good to see you and look forward to uh to doing it again soon